Thank you very much. I am, oh, I am not good. surprised, but gratified that this audience shares my sense of what this film does and how well. I'm going to start off with a few questions for director Jay Roach and actors Brian Cranston and Anthony Mackey and the writer Robert Schenken. And towards the end, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Um, as I mentioned before the screening, one of the things that struck me was that even though this is destined for a television screen for HBO beginning Saturday night, that this was really a motion picture, a movie in every best sense of the term. And I was struck, for example, of how, with how the beginning, the camera discovers details from the blood in the back of the convertible to the hospital, through the corridor, till the whispered he's gone in Johnson's ear. So I'd like to start off by asking the director, Jay Roach, even though you knew this would be for television, did you direct it exactly like a motion picture? Were there any mm -hmm. changes in conception? Um, not really. We, we really do come at these uh, as if they're movies. Um, people have big screens now. You have good sound. And I don't shoot for you know a small screen look. Um, but that particular, this choice on this film as opposed to some, to some other films, which I also treated like films Recount and Game Change, which I also did at, uh, at HBO, this film was different. It was all derived for, and fairly specifically suggested in Robert's screenplay. Robert did the adaptation of his great play uh, on Broadway. And um, the idea that this was an anxiety dream, this is, this is, was LBJ wanted to be president his whole life. There are stories of him talking about it since he was a little kid that he thought he might be president one day. And he worked, he went through all the steps, a uh, dozen years in the House of Representatives, a dozen years in the Senate, you know, uh, vice president uh, in a very tough choice to become vice president uh, at the time. And he gets the job in the worst possible way, he is instantly seen as the accidental president, the usurper and is surrounded by Kennedys who hate him <laughs> and, and is judged compared to the Kennedys who were, who were uh, like royalty, you know, and he's the guy from Texas. So I just wanted to feel like, wow, that's not what I would have expected from a story about a president of the United States, particularly one as charismatic and larger than life uh, as Johnson was. Well, I, I think that one of the reasons the film works as well as it does is the inclusion of the intimate private moments. In fact, in asking Robert Schenken about this, I think my favorite scene in the film might be the very quiet one of uh, Lady Bird sitting down to, next to Lyndon Johnson when he starts smoking a cigarette. And she looks, and she simply picks <laughs> one up and starts smoking it too, and then he puts his out. So my question is, is that kind of intimacy in close-up possible only in a film? And was there any correlation to that in, this, in the stage play, or did you rethink everything along these lines? No, uh, it was really a complete cinematic reimagining of the story. And, and you're absolutely right. That, that particular kind of intimacy and uh, behavior is placed so much better on the screen than it, than it can on stage. You can do it on stage. But, but boy, does it carry a wallop uh, uh, on the screen. And that uh, moment that you suggest was uh, something I had read about a long time ago and taken a note on and thought, boy, that's pretty great, you know. Uh, and, and here was the opportunity to do that where I couldn't have done it on Broadway. Yeah. And in fact, tonight, watching it for the second time, I could sense a little bit better how there was this alternation between the public or political scenes like Fanny talking about, you know, publicly what she endured, cross-cut with something like, uh, I think it's Walter in the bathroom with Lady Bird, you know, after Johnson's been particularly brusque with her in that quiet moment that ends with her putting on the lipstick. Was that kind of alternation already in the script or was it partly in the editing process that the public-private rhythm was elaborated? I think a lot of it was in the script. It found a sometimes different rhythms, and as we compressed or expanded things, it, the intercutting uh, worked differently. But that was, Robert's script opened up the movie in such a great way, but I often see what makes something cinematic is when the camera can be right in a face of a great, great actors. If you can be over the shoulder of Humphrey when LBJ's 
comes right into him and says, cold comfort, you are, you know, like that. Oh, I love that moment so much. And I, that was, that was a, that's cinema, you know, that's, like, oh, yeah. that's like getting a camera where, where you want to be what, what you want to be part of. And the, the play did it beautifully too, but in just a different way for a, a room bigger than this even, you know, uh, um, he, there was a different feeling. The play, the play did it in a kind of ritualistic way because you had the other actors who were not on stage in the scene, but on stage observing the scene. So even in a intimate scene of power negotiation between two individuals, you had the sense of the public just outside whose lives are going to be dramatically affected by that. That wouldn't have worked at all cinematically. So instead, uh, we found together what Jay's describing, this, this ability to move in and out uh, and the juxtaposition of, the, of these scenes, intimate scenes with crowd scenes. Sure. And of course, that does lead me to ask the actors. First, Brian Cranston, I mean, All the Way was your first Broadway show for which you won a Tony. And here, you're, and for me, it's an incarnation. It's not a performance. It's an incarnation of Lyndon Johnson. Could you talk? <laughs> Could you talk a little about the process? I mean, I know there are lots of layers, but obviously LBJ was a very public person, and I can imagine how in theater that works magnificently as you're addressing crowds and have people on the stage. But for the film, it's a completely different process by which you're dealing not only with the other characters in the camera, but even the voiceover narration. So just could you talk a little about how you had to rethink or rework the muscles that were your JFK, mm -hmm. your, your LBJ ones? Well, darling, I'll <laughs> tell you what we're going to do. Um, you know, the approach to, uh, to the character first is no different if you're about to go on stage or in film. You want to be a dry sponge to it and open yourself up to whatever stimuli you may get going down to the Johnson Library a couple times and spending six, seven hours at a, at a stretch uh, down there. Um, and they're so helpful, and it's a great library, by the way, in Austin, Texas, if you ever get down there. Uh, and they would be saying, what, what, tell us what you're looking for, and we'll guide you toward that. And my answer, and I think most actors' answer is, I don't know what I'm looking for but I know when I see it or feel it. And um, so it's about accumulating all this information from all the biographies and his autobiography and the source material, um, audio tapes and videotapes and, and people who uh, were alive and knew him well, his daughters. And so we're, the, the amount of input can make you feel bloated because it's all coming in, and so far you haven't expelled anything. You're, you're holding it all in, trying to figure out what is useful to me at any given time. And of course, then you keep going back to the text and seeing uh, how does this apply. Is, is this information applicable to what we're doing in this one year of his life? Um, sometimes little tidbits from his childhood is very helpful. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes you'll learn more about uh, the trials and tribulations of Vietnam, but for this particular period, it wasn't as helpful. So you start compartmentalizing what you need to do and how you need to clean your room of all, these, all this stuff and moving things around. And trust that at some point the character comes in and you present it. Um, your sensibility of that, and when, when, when the character does finally get into you through osmosis, perhaps, um, then you start filtering, you start thinking through the character, through that filter. Of what you, um, the difference between doing it on stage and doing it in, for film is um, relatively uh, contrasting, it, it's very different. We had a 1,450-seat theater in New York, and it, and it was raked way up high. We were told often, keep your heads up. Uh, otherwise, they would just see the crown of your head. So it, it, 
It has to communicate through your, uh, through your facial expressions and also body language and, and vocal quality. So with film, you get to get in so close that you can whisper a line. And even if I was miked in the theater, you still couldn't really whisper. It's just too soft and you don't want an audience craning to try to hear you to understand. It's too much work for them. So you're not communicating. Um, but it's, it, was, it was fun to do both, really. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the experience. Yeah. Well, in terms of what you're describing, my question for Anthony Mackie is related because I was really impressed by the understated quality, the subtlety of the performance as Martin Luther King Jr. Because I've seen more in other films the public orator whether it was David Oyelowo in Selma last year or Jeffrey Wright in Boycott. And I was wondering if you could talk a little about how you developed this you know, rather private image of, of Martin Luther King. Did you watch either of those films or perhaps Paul Winfield in the Martin Luther King miniseries from uh, the, the late 70s? I think yeah. it was. Um, when I was a kid every year for uh, Dr. King's birthday, they would play the miniseries on television, and my dad would bring all six of us in the living room, make us sit down and watch it every year. <laughs> 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 and Paul Winfield was so amazing, I actually thought he was Dr. King until I got to high school. Like, whenever I saw a picture of Dr. King, I was like, why is that dude dressed up like Dr. King? <laughs> so, because of that, I always shunned the notion of, um, playing Dr. King, because in my house, my, my dad really had a firm understanding of who he thought Dr. King was, and uh, he passed that on to his children. And um, I've never read a script that portrayed the Dr. King that I knew, that I grew up knowing. Um, we're in a time now where uh, humbleness and generosity and um, nonviolence is considered weak, it's considered passive. And, um, you know, uh, Dr. King was revolutionary. He was a radical. If you look at some of the speeches he gave and some of the things he uh, acted upon, they were, in this day and age, they w I think people would, their heads would explode mm -hmm. if there was a Dr. King in this day and age. Um, but he was steadfast in his approach to taking on the fight. And um, because of that, I, uh, the first time I talked to Robert, he um, and and Jay, they gave me literally sent me an email with so much source information, and I was in Atlanta doing Captain America at the time, and fortunately my brother went to Morehouse College where Dr. King went to school, and uh, I've been doing a mentoring program with Morehouse College for a while, so I went over and I was like, yo, I'm playing Dr. King, and um, they took me <laughs> in and just gave me, uh, you know, a, a run of the gamut and uh, introduced me to men who not only worked with Dr. King, but marched alongside him. And, um, you know, sitting and talking with them and watching these videos and uh, this archive of footage that some of which people have never seen. Um, I saw a King that was a really cool dude. He was, I mean, he was just a brother of brothers, you know? And um, that's the thing I had never seen in any other movie. I had never seen anyone capture the humane aspect of him. It was always the public idea of him, but it was never the idea of who he was as a man when the doors were closed and the cameras were off. And um, when I saw that in this script, I was so excited to try and find that material and see that aspect of him in uh, real life. Yeah. And I think also one of the wonderful things about the screenplay and, and the focus is we get to see that Martin Luther King within his own circle had to work with the same kind of exigencies and compromises that Lyndon Johnson had to. In other words, they couldn't just become superheroes in a certain sense by, I'm gonna do this. You see the degrees of compromise and pressure and that, you know, it, it's always not just personal, it's politics, I mean, but there's so much politics mm -hmm. to get any sort of consensus and, and movement done. So that comes through very much in the scenes with Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's Ali Frazier. That's the great <laughs> thing. When I first read this script, I, I've, I've always said this movie should be called The Great Compromise, because we're in a day and age now where the idea of compromise is shattered. Yeah. 
You know, um, LBJ, <laughs> LBJ was so amazing because he ruled the Senate with a heavy hand. That's right. And he took that ruling to the White House. And once he became president, he basically made the Senate understand, Republican or Democrat, we're going to get things done. And uh, we don't have that today. We live in a very black or white society. And what was so amazing, LBJ and King lived in a gray society. That's right, literally. Well, now that you're raising this, you could also be describing something that's obviously not of our time, but from the movie Lincoln, which we screened here at the Y a couple of years ago before it opened. And at moments, this film did make me think of Spielberg's Lincoln, even though obviously a very different story. That one, script by Tony Kushner, but based on Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, and she was one of the great writers about LBJ and, and with LBJ. And cons she consulted with us as well. It, uh, I wouldn't, yeah. that doesn't surprise me <laughs> yeah. for a second. So my question is, because Steven Spielberg, who directed Lincoln, is one of the producers on this film, and because both of these great motion pictures about presidents who understood how much you have to compromise, negotiate, glad hand, I mean, manipulate. You know. mm -hmm. um, how much of an effect did Spielberg have on this film? Did he consult with you about any creative aspects? He, he, was, uh, he was around quite a bit, actually. He wasn't on the set, or uh, I think he visited once, but he, his big impact was in casting. He, had, he weighed in on, and uh, um, sort of approved everybody that I, we, we put forward. And he had some great notes in post-production just uh, about emphasis. You know, he just sent me notes, saw cuts, we would, we would send him. But I, it's such a great uh, honor to be even mentioned in the, in the same breath as that film. And, but I, I, do, I do think it's, it, it's a credit to, to Robert's the way he had approached the story, because both films did try to see that that uh, these these situ these men accomplished things when there were so many things working against them. And in the case here, uh, to compare the factions that were pulling the conservative uh, NAACP people, Roy, uh, Roy Wilkins, and uh, up against uh, Robert Moses and Stokely Carmichael, who are pulling King further to the left, and then LBJ is being yanked by the conservative Democrats, which. Also, ha we had that in common with the Lincoln situation, which isn't the case anymore. There are no Dix not as many uh, Dixiecrats. Dixiecrats. Uh, they all went to the Republican Party since then, uh, and and the, and the liberal Republicans. So it, the the getting down into the weeds of the politics was what was so powerful about the play, and I think was powerful about uh, Robert's screenplay and seeing all the forces. And that compromise is not a dirty word. You know, that's, it, it's, the, it's what you have to do. Absolutely. To One of the uh, most important things Stephen did was Jay Roach. He, J Steven Spielberg said, Jay Roach is your, you, you, Jay Roach should direct this. <laughs> so let's. Uh, it's a, it's Yet another reason. And despite I Robert's and my <laughs> objections to that, <laughs> he, he I, did. <laughs> you know, actually, early on, Robert and I had a meeting with Stephen. Uh, before we did the Broadway production. This is after the ART Boston production. And he told us that he, he wants to do this film, and he wants it, us to be directly involved in this and to make it. And he said he'll watch the play. He'll come to New York and watch the play four or five times. And at that time, he'll know if he's the one to direct this movie. And and it was a really interesting observation about his process, that if he's absorbing it and absorbing it, but can't find a way to crack it, to take it from one medium to the next, then he'll find, he said, if, I, if it's not me, I'll find the right director for you. And we're like, yeah, oh, that's good. You know, that's good. <laughs> sure, Stephen. Yeah, sure. And he did. He Absolutely. came multiple times to the, to the play in New York and, um, and eventually said, it's not me. I can't find a way in, so I have to find the director who can find. And maybe in a way it might not have been as exciting for him because the Lincoln story had so many overlaps. I mean, in both cases, you're looking at a towering president, literally and figuratively, but in less than a year, right, when they are trying to accomplish two very specific things. I mean, I remember how in Lincoln, it's not only to end the Civil War, it's the abolition of slavery. 
How close is that ultimately yeah. to the story of um, it's painful the way. that it's that close, though. After all those years, absolutely, it, right. it's and very that it's still not entirely over. It's just well. In fact, I mean, so I, I do have a question that maybe I'll start with Robert, but it's for all of you. I can't help but think about the timing of this particular film premiering Saturday in this election year, um, and specifically even in its overlap with last year's Selma, where I have to point out the character of Lyndon Johnson was secondary, well played by Tom Wilkinson, but that film did not acknowledge to the extent that this one does, the historical reality of Lyndon Johnson's absolute commitment to the Civil Rights Act. But there you have you know, the importance of voter registration for the black community and We've been hearing for the past year of how in our own day, so many efforts are being made to inhibit voters, especially black voters and poor voters in certain states. We are still struggling with the same legacy, which leads to the question, what is your hope for the effect of all the way on people who will watch it in this election year? Well, uh, you know, I, I think the, the feeling is that uh, the play and now the, the movie is really entering the national conversation. And, and certainly one of the things that I hope people will come away with is this stark reminder uh, of the idea that government can do good for people. Government, it, that's, that was why it was constructed. That's why the forefathers built it the way they did. Um, and this notion that government is the source of all problems and that government uh, should be emasculated and uh, you know, reduced to the size of a bathtub and then drowned in it. Um, you know, and we've seen, we've seen the results of that, which is there are no results uh, of that. So I hope that one of the things that people take away from this is, is the sense of, oh, yeah, government actually really did a lot of things at one time, good things, important things, things that made everyone's life better, better Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Civil Rights Act, immigration reform, consumer health, environmental health, all these things, uh, education, all of these things are the legacy of the great society. And um, so I certainly hope that one of the things people come away with is the recognition that, oh, that is possible. And, and with that, some optimism about, well, we can do that again. If, if we put our minds to it, we can do that. We can have that again. Hmm. And um, others, do you have any feelings? In this? Well, uh, you know, I worked on recount, and I thought that was going to lead to massive voter reform. <laughs> uh, we'd all be automatically registered when we go to the DMV. We'd be able to vote, you know, uh, autom you know, online or as, as easy as possible, whatever it would take. Voting should be so easy. Wow, did I? Uh, did we, it was it a humbling thing to see all these steps. Uh, taken backwards, and, and I, I think it, voting rights was, was so important to Dr. King and the civil rights leaders. What, what those people did, uh, Robert Moses, Stokely, Fannie Lou Hamer, I mean, they, those are the real heroes. That summer when they went down uh, for, for Freedom Summer, got beaten, arrested, murdered, you know, just to vote, you know, and that's, that, that's really one, of, that was the most emotionally, um, upsetting and, and motivating things. And I hope people are, are reminded of the sacrifices people uh, have made to, to achieve voting rights and renew the efforts if, if, if there is a way to, <laughs> to get people focused back on that. Because voting is everything. It's everything. It's, all, it's what matters. What, and most of us doing? who are lucky, we take it for granted. Yeah. And not realizing that there are a lot of people out there who don't have the awareness and the opportunity. Yeah. Um, any other, uh, what would you like to see happen in terms of? She's, yeah. she's baiting us. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. she's just, she's yeah. just letting you have your yeah. two cents. If you I was just it. enjoying the drapes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're like a royal They're lovely. Blue. Yeah, <laughs> lovely, lovely. Great day. Great day. I'm going to turn the, uh, <laughs> direction of the nice. questions. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, this is actually, um, more for, for Brian Cranston because as you know, I was a huge fan of your work last year in Trumbo, and aware that... <laughs> 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 
Dalton Trumbo and Lyndon Johnson were contemporaries. They <coughs> existed and, and fought in a certain sense at the same time. And given these roles, and of course, Walter White, Breaking Bad, it leads me to ask whether one of the, one of the main criteria when you're choosing which parts to do is that it be a person of contradictions. Because it seems that there are many in at least these three characters that I've seen you do. I am actually not that deep. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> it's true. I, uh, <laughs> um, the, I, I do have a, a criteria that I select projects by, but it's not character first. <coughs> it's always story first. Story has to resonate with me, within me. It has to be relevant. It has to mean something. Um, even if it's simple joy, or, then it's, it's positive. It's valuable. So the story has to ring true and, and stay with me. No different than when you're reading a great novel and you can't wait to get back to it, or it's on your mind. It's the same thing with a, with a screenplay or a play. It stays with you, conjures thoughts and ideas. But separate from that is the strength of the text to support that great story. And they're not always, in fact, many times, they're not the same. So you can have a great story, but it's not completely supported. It did, the, the, the screenplay or the play, it just didn't live up to the greatness of the story and you're so, upset about it, you know, and, and, and it could be vice versa. Boy, it was really well written. I don't care about the story at all. So you have, it's lopsided. So for me, it has to hit the high mark on, on both of those two things first. And then I go to the character. Is, this, is the character important to the outcome of the story? Is, is, it, is it relevant? Is it something that I feel I am challenged by? Can I get into it? Um, is this a character that scares me a little bit? That's always a good sign. Um, and and then, I, then I look at the director who's involved in that sense. <laughs> Who else is going to be in this cast and things like that, and it goes down the line. So for, for all the way, it was really Mr. Shankin's writing that stayed with me. And uh, yeah. It doesn't... It doesn't matter how great that character is. If the story isn't good and the, sc and the screenplay or the play isn't well constructed, you're not going to have a good time. Yeah. You're, you're, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I look for. Once that is uh, you know, uh, obtained, that kind of criteria, then you go deeper into the character to discuss it more with the director, with the writer, to see if... Are we on the same wavelength? Are we uh, close? Are we circling the same wagons? And, and can we work together? Is there a, a collaboration? Can we, is there an ebb and flow? Are, are we listening to each other and responding to each other? Because that's when you really know it's working well, when that triumvirate are, is, is at its best and, and functioning high. Understood. And for Anthony Mackey, um, similarly, I'm, I'm, I'm interested because obviously you have been balancing quite a bit between independent, lower budgeted films and the big blockbuster type films, Captain America, for example. Um, is your criteria similar to the one that Brian Cranston just talked about or do you have other ways of approaching it? Um, no, it's very similar. I heard a story when I was in college don't know if it's true or not. But um, when Kevin Spacey uh, used to get scripts, he would have them white, white out all the specifics about the character's age, mm -hmm. race, whatever. And he would read the script just for the story. And then he would go back and ask them, now what character do you want me to play? And read it from the perspective of that character. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so amazing. I thought that was the coolest thing I had ever heard. And um, I don't know if it's true. I've, if you know Kevin, call him and ask him, because I don't know. Um, but I've always done that since I heard that story. And, um, you know, the great thing about this script, when I read it, 
you know, I, when I, I knew, I, I was like, well, it was Dr. King. I knew I wasn't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jay wasn't like, we're going to go way out of the box here. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So just bear with it. Just listen to the pitch first and tell, just don't say no. It wasn't that conversation. But um, when I read it, you know, I read it from the perspective of LBJ. And because I think, you know, since middle school, I've heard so many disparaging stories about this man and so many negative connotations about this man. And the more I got into history, the more I was appreciative for his existence uh, because he did so much while he was president. And uh, he, he utilized his office in the right way. And I felt like that was one of the last times that has happened. Um, and what was so great about it when I read the script, I got this man's story. And it was so different from the play. You know, I expected to pick up the script in this because the play was all Brian all day. You know, and it was like, <laughs> Brian in an office, Brian at home, <laughs> Brian giving a speech, <laughs> Brian walking across the stage, you know, and which was, Do which like was, I mean, it was pretty good. You have a great strut, man. It was, <laughs> <laughs> nothing like you walking, baby, nothing <laughs> like you walking. <laughs> But the play, I felt, was about LBJ. The movie, I feel, is about the world of LBJ. And that's what gives you the essence of the man and the feel of that, that insecurity, that fear. And uh, when I saw that, I thought it was, it, was, it was beautiful. And it fed right into um, my insecurities of playing Dr. King. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this leads me to go back to Robert Schenken. And by the way, we haven't actually mentioned her name. I just wanted to acknowledge, though she's not here with us tonight, that Melissa Leo gives such... You know, I... Whatever Lady Bird Johnson was on stage, I, I don't know, but in this film, she just anchors every scene that she's in in the most quiet, powerful way. Um, so, you know, kudos to you for, for bringing that out in addition to the wonderful male presences here. For Robert Schenken, I gather that you sort of knew Johnson, your fa well, your father, if I remember correctly, because you were raised in Texas, your father knew Johnson when he was a senator, and he tried to get his support to create the first public TV and radio station in the Southwest. I gather that you, as a young boy, even volunteered for his uh, campaign. So, I, I guess, I want to know, what did Johnson mean to you? Why was it so important, in your opinion, to create this world? Well, he, uh, there was this kind of odd family connection. And growing up in Austin, Texas, which is the heart of the hill country, it's hard to escape his presence. And so I grew up in a household where, because of his support for public television, uh, he was a friend of the court. And, and I did participate that, that 64 election, and I wore my button and I had my all the way stickers on my books, and my mom took me down to Congress Avenue and I volunteered in the office. And, and then when he beat Goldwater in the Manichaean politics of 1964, it was a triumph of light over dark. And then just 18 months later, when troop levels in Vietnam had gone up from 25,000 to 170,000, and my oldest brother was uh, 18 and, and draftable, suddenly I, had a, a different feeling about him. And, and, and that feeling would change yet again as a young artist trying to raise a family in this country and becoming aware of the uh, programs that were actually very helpful to me and that they had their genesis in the great society. So I had this very complicated relationship with him, but he was always rattling around up there because, partly because he was such an extraordinary, interesting, complicated individual and then as I got into it, 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 there were two reasons. One, LBJ had such a profound effect on this country. Uh, Joe Califano, Jr., who was the uh, chief of staff, says, we live in the world that LBJ created. Uh, I think in many ways that's true. That, that, that's actually true, a profound uh, effect. And, and the, the final reason was that it enabled me to approach a thematic concern that I continue to explore uh, in, in different uh, variations. This whole notion of power, uh, the proper acquisition and exercise of power, uh, and morality. You know, what, uh, uh, how far can you go, how far should you go in order to do good? 
uh, in as much as you define that. It's a, it's a vexing problem and central, I think, right now to our dysfunction as a society politically. So this character enabled and this story enabled me to get at ideas that, that continue to haunt me and that I think are important. And that's what drew me to it. Yeah. Okay. Now, I have at least 10 more questions, but I know that some of you in the audience would like to raise a few to our guests. So I'm going to call on a few people, and because we don't have that much time, there is somebody right in the middle there who's got his hand way up. Uh, yes, sir, go right ahead, and I'll repeat the question. It's a question about the degree of makeup that Brian Cranston had to have for the film as compared to the stage, especially because there would be so much time with the camera on you in close up as opposed to the stage in longer shot. It was one of our first conversations, both during the play and uh, doing the film uh, in Boston. I did one day where I went in full makeup and and it was like, wow, that's that's really, transformative, they really look a lot like him. And, um, and yet, I would have to apply the prosthetics myself, and I'm not really qualified to do that, and it takes me <laughs> too long, and maybe one of the cheeks would fall off <laughs> in the middle of it, and I would just have to try to... Um, what I did, uh, what I ended up doing, was little, little teardrop lobes that I added, which put about a, about another inch and a half or so to my ears down to there. And I used it as sort of a, a zen preparation. I got to the theater before anyone else and put on some music and, and glued the ears on and then blended it and then you know, put the rest of the makeup on, my microphone in the, embedded in my hair, and then slicked it back and put some gray in it. And it was kind of a, kind of a ritual. When we were going to do the movie, however, as, as, a, as, a, as a theater audience, you watch through a wide-angle lens, and through the text and through lighting and direction, we're suggesting where you might want to focus your attention, but you don't have to. You can look anywhere you want. In, the, in film, the director is telling you what to look at. It doesn't really give you a choice, really unless you're staying in the wide. Um, so coming in close, we knew we wanted to do more prosthetics to make it really work. And Bill Corso, an Oscar-winning makeup artist, created the, the makeup. I, Anne Morgan did the hair, which consisted of taking my hairline back two inches and then thinning it out completely, just completely thinning, 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 thinning. I had that bald patch in the back and just kept thinning it. That saved me about an hour a day. So I was, I was willing, let's, let's do that. Uh, the makeup itself total took two and a half hours every morning. Uh, I had, implant, I had uh, cheeks, I had a nose, a chin, and uh, the ears which also dropped but started up here. And then he also put prosthetics behind the ear that pushed them out. So once, once they pushed out, you, you're paying more attention to the ears. <laughs> and then in one sequence, they started flapping and I started flying away. <laughs> it was remarkable. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it, but it, it was also very helpful. Uh, to sit there at six o'clock in the morning with a cup of coffee and looking at yourself in the mirror and this genius goes to work on your face and you're just sitting there. But you're looking in the mirror and all of a sudden you start to see him come out and come to the surface. And then pretty soon you, you go, well, there he is. Ah, see you again. How you doing this morning? <laughs> you know, and uh, it, was, uh, it, it, it was fun. And uh, you started out, I, I have two facial qualities that I share with LBJ that every man would love to have, and that's thin lips and beady eyes. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> 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 
And a very commanding voice. Right. <laughs> Somehow it's... <laughs> okay, there was uh, another question that I... Yes, right there. Crystal meth. I really enjoyed the film, just a little disappointed there wasn't more about crystal meth in the film. That you saw. I think that's really... Okay, the question, I'm, I'm just going to repeat, the question is about the depiction of the Vietnam War, at least mention of it in this film, which is quite minimal compared to the focus on the other aspects. And, um, I'm, I'm sorry, did I get that right? Yeah. And is, like, why or... Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm no, going to also direct this to Robert Schenken, because if I understand correctly, you've written a sequel. I have. The yeah. Great Society, yeah. which premiered at the Seattle Rep, which does cover more... This is, this is November 63, November 64, and actually if you go back, Vietnam is, is not very prominent at this time. It really isn't. Um, the American public is about 85, 90% in support of Jack Kennedy's policy uh, in Vietnam at that time. And um, uh, what we do have in the film, which is pivotal, of course, is the Gulf of Tonkin incident where um, LBJ makes the critical decision to lie to the American public and to Congress about what actually took place in the Gulf of Tonkin and to ask and receive the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which is the beginning of the slippery slope uh, into the escalation. So, in fact, we do hit the one critical event related to Vietnam in this period. The ramp up really begins uh, a, a year later. And then, and then it goes to hell in a handbasket. And yes, there is a sequel called The Great Society, which picks up November 64 to March 68, when he goes on TV and shocks mm. the country by announcing that he will not run for re-election. And that's where, that's where we, the tragedy of Lyndon Johnson, where uh, his failure to uh, reconcile uh, this disastrous foreign policy um, with his truly passion felt domestic policy um, and it all comes uh, it all comes to a wreck might that become a film as well the great society uh, from your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually for this gentleman um, I can mention there was another film made for, made for HBO in 2002 called path to war and it starred Michael Gambon as Lyndon Johnson and it was uh, directed by John Frankenheimer, by the way, a very, you get this picture of a very powerful man in a powerful position who becomes powerless as the war rages on. The focus there is more on Robert McNamara, played by Alec Baldwin. Oh, and also it, it includes Sarah Paulson, who you cast in um, uh, Game Change as uh, Lucy Baines. Nicole Wallace. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, Nicole yeah. yeah. Wallace. And um, it's, it's an interesting companion film that also humanizes Lyndon <clears throat> Johnson, but in my opinion, is not as successful not as close. this one. Not even close. Not, not, <laughs> not <laughs> even close, um, no, of course. It was course. a really interesting film, actually. I, you had seen I it. I saw it, yes, yes. Did, did others here see that one by any chance? I, I've seen it, I've seen it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different focus, but there the Vietnam issue is addressed directly. Um, I think we have time for only one more question. If not, I'm going to... Oh, yeah, okay, right ahead. She said, it's not a question... ...that having attended recently a symposium on race in America and seeing this show twice, but now in this particular moment that the timing is so important for this film to be shown. Um, I couldn't say it better myself, so I'm just gonna close by reminding you that if you wanna watch it again, HBO, and tell your friends starting Saturday night. But I also just wanna express my profound appreciation to all of you. I mean, Jay Roach has been doing fantastic 
political recreation in a most entertaining way for many years, but it's the first time that this particular conjunction of talents, Robert Schenken's screenplay, and the really powerful performances of Anthony Mackie and Brian Cranston, what a gift. Thank you.